Starting a business is all consuming. To throw into the mix a two and a half year old whilst you're flying to the US once a month, it was really, really hard. Michelle Kennedy is the founder and CEO of Peanut, one of the fastest growing social networking apps for women focusing on fertility, pregnancy, motherhood, and menopause. It's hard on your friendships. It's hard on your relationship. It was really challenging. I had no team, no product, half of the funding. I was fundraising whilst pregnant. Literally, I think we closed the round and I had Nula three days later. Male money. That's where it starts and that's where it ends. Them getting richer and we're not part of it. And unless we increase women's wealth, we can't increase the land share of anything. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Very excited to talk to you. Um, I think we have a lot to talk about. So I much. mean, I feel like we could probably natter for the entire day, but I don't think that would be good for your <laughs> schedule or anyone listening. Um, so I'm going to start for people who um, want to know a bit about your background, kind of where you come from, how you got to where you are now. Could you give us a little whistle stop tour of your career? Yes, I'll try. So um, I started life as a corporate lawyer, actually. So I... Um, trained in Newcastle, at a firm called Dickinson Dees, moved down to London and joined a firm called Mishcon and was doing m and um, Was doing that kind of for one particular client. So then went in-house to work for them. And it was in biotech, so a completely different field. We were doing lots of acquisitions. All mm -hmm. the time we were doing acquisitions, so much fun. As soon as we weren't doing that and it was consolidation, it was more about learning about the business. That was cool, but it obviously wasn't the thing that I was like really Didn't keep on fire. Yep. Yeah. And uh, one of the lawyers I used to work for reached out and he said, listen, there's this young guy and he's got um, a dating website. He needs a lawyer. And I was like, ew. Okay. <laughs> Perfect, might find not, a friend. Not, not really my thing. Also, at the time, dating is not what it is today, right? Yeah. Dating was Match.com, eHarmony. It was still had that stigma of, and they met online. Yeah. Versus where we are today. So it was a totally different world and I really wasn't that into it. But I went to meet him. And uh, what I found was this tiny, grubby little office in Denmark Street in Soho, full of engineers drinking Red Bull and eating hula hoops. And I was like, this is a world I've never seen before. It's mm -hmm. not corporate and it's not polished um, and it's not biotech labs. And, um, but there was something about it that was exciting. I met Andre, who was the founder of Badoo, and the rest is kind of history. I kind of loved what they were doing. At the time that I joined, they had 52 million users and I'd never heard of it before. So you can imagine that I was like, what is this like sorcery? That they were huge at one stage. Huge. Yeah. And so even at that point to have 52 million users and I don't know what it is, um, Facebook was just becoming, you know, a bit more of a kind of a scene in London um, and they had an office here. And so I was starting to become aware of tech, um, but it still wasn't again where it is today. And I was like, fine, I'm going to do it. So I joined him as his lawyer, actually. And I remember starting on day one and walking into that office. They moved to a different grubby office in Soho and um, walked in. There was like a pile of contracts on this desk. And I was like, what is that? And he, I don't know. <laughs> wow. Um, and so started to take on the legal function. The good thing about it is everyone felt they had to tell me everything because I was a lawyer and they were like, <gasps> Let me tell everything. So it was really quick to get to know the business. I could ask all the stupid questions when I had no idea what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then just because I'm a really nosy person and talk too much probably and ask too much, um, I started to ask lots of questions and acquire different functions. So setting up HR, finance, BI, mm -hmm. all of the kind of back-end support functions to the main business um, and eventually became deputy CEO. So working next to Andre, the founder, and worked with him for six years and uh, I loved it and I hated it and I loved it and mm -hmm. it was brilliant and he's a very challenging person to work with and for but a brilliant person um, and so I learned loads from him um, and then we started building what became um, Bumble and life was amazing and I loved it, but I was working in an industry where I'd seen this uh, migration from web to mobile. So when I started, everything was web. Then we had to get to mobile. We were a bit late to the party. Then Tinder came out, changed the whole concept of what dating was online, made it socially acceptable, made it cool. 
made it so that it was a different age demo as well. Mm. And then we had to kind of like regain the crown almost and, and start innovating and building. And I loved everything about it. But I just had my son. So I was working in an office which was full of completely honest young guys. And all of a sudden they were like, she's a mom. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, and things, <laughs> things somewhat changed. Um, and it was exciting because we start, we were building Bumble at that point. Finn was like six months old. But I was working on this amazing stuff in the day. And then I got home and I was like, you know, reading like weird threads on Baby Center at 2 a.m. So mm -hmm. it was like le leading two lives. So I did what everyone does when they have a business idea, which is absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Carried on doing like my real job. Um, and then as Finn started to get older, I was like, actually, this isn't going anywhere. The opportunity is there. I had a couple of ideas of businesses that I thought I might like to do. Um, it wasn't always just like straight, quick and um, peanut, but I always had this concept around that women deserve better, mothers deserve better. There's absolutely. an opportunity here. Yeah. Um, and so in 2016, I left my job, terrifying, stayed on the board of both companies, Bumble and Badoo, and started building what became Peanut. And then we launched it the following year. God. And you, did you take that, that initial leap of faith of leaving your job? How much had you done in the background for Peanut at that stage? Yeah. Honestly, I had done nothing for Peanut, but I'd saved and that was the most right. important thing, right? So I had little people, a little, a little person, safety net. Yeah, I had someone who was dependent on me, my son. Mm -hmm. You have, I had a mortgage, bills to pay. And I was like, I can't, I cannot just dump everything and yeah. go. I had to have a little war chest of rainy day. If I need to pay people to get this started, how am I going to do it if I don't get funding? And so I had done that part. But really the kind of that part to um, working out like what peanut was going to be. No, I didn't do that until afterwards. And so at that stage, what was the, you know, when you're starting the business itself, what is the initial kind of concept for Peanut? At that point, it was really, is it a valid proposition? Mm -hmm. Women who are mothers will connect via an app. And that was it. Can I use algorithms that we use for dating? Can I apply it to women who are moms? Can I use it to make platonic friendship? Will it resonate? It's meant to be fun. It's a bit of a game. Many of these women will never have used Bumble or Tinder. Mm -hmm. um, some of the women will have used Bumble and Tinder and therefore this will be fine and second nature. Um, and that was really it. Can I get women to use an app to make friends? Interesting. And so at, at that stage when you started testing the idea and you started, I assume, gathering people together yeah. to be like, this is what we're making. What did you kind of come up against any things that really shook the fundamental idea that made you think, okay, we might have to go in a slightly different direction or was it pretty smooth sailing from there to, I mean, smooth sailing, I'm sure it wasn't, Never. but was it pretty kind of, did the concept stay largely similar between there and actually making a, an MVP? The concept didn't change actually from this is how it's going to start. I always knew that we wanted to build something bigger. Mm -hmm. That part was still somewhat undefined, but I knew that the hook was going to be the matchmaking friendship finding that was always going to be the hook it was how we articulated the community forum that part that was undefined and to be defined and we could only build that if we got the first part right right because building a community from zero is hard building a community with women who are already in a same situation with a commonality mm -hmm. well that's a bit easier so I always had that part but I don't think it it I didn't waver on it. I just got a lot of feedback from men who would be like, I, I don't get it. Women won't the use tech this. for women. Yeah. <laughs> just <What? be> ridiculous. <laughs> friends? <laughs> women don't need friends. My wife spends all day talking to her friends. I had loads of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I can imagine that went down well. Um, tell us the journey then from, from leaving your job, having the idea, to having a product. So I left in the February of 2016 and uh, I was still, I mean, I was still doing work for Badoo. So really I left, but I didn't really leave. Mm -hmm. um, and then really it was the summer that, that started. Um, I'd gone to New York to see Whitney, who's the uh, CEO of Bumble. And I was like, listen, I'm working on this thing and this is what I think it's going to be. What do you think? I mean, when I look at that deck now, I cringe. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you think? And she was like, I mean, amazing, love it. And she actually was the one who introduced me to my first investor. So that was all very exciting. And then you get that first term sheet and you're like, oh my God, it's real. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go. I had no team, no product. 
half of the funding, had to go and close all the rest of the funding, build a team, start building. We started building in the September, we launched in the following February, so it was pretty quick. And um, the way I did it is I spoke to women and every woman I spoke to, I asked her to introduce me to someone else. So mm -hmm. that by the time we launched, I had a little baseline of women who felt very invested and connected with what we were going to launch. Um, but also a feedback loop for what they didn't like. And, you know, you know, women are super vocal. Mm -hmm. Like we, if we love, we're in love. And if we don't like, we're going to tell you that we don't like something. So um, we had a lot of that to go through. And how did you get that first term sheet from the introduction? So for, for anyone who doesn't know, a term sheet is what you get when someone's essentially saying, yes, okay, I will invest in something. Um, it's, not, it's not closing the round. It's essentially saying, we'll invest in you this much at this value, um, just kind of for context. How did you get from the introduction from Whitney to considering you didn't have a product, it was very much, yeah. you know, this, the seed of the seed yeah. um, and getting to actually um, closing a round. It was hard work. That's the only way I can describe it. I, I need to just set the scene on one thing, which is I had no experience of raising venture. Mm -hmm. And it's really important. I had no idea. I'd run a company. It was a big company. We had one PE, which is private equity investor who held a minority stake and we were profitable. Yeah. Very different business, right? <laughs> so my biggest challenge was did we meet the KPIs this quarter? And is the how large is the dividend going to be that I'm paying yeah. off, right? It was literally, it was a very profitable dividend paying business. And so to go to venture, I was a bit like, you know, I, I don't, we, we don't, don't intend on making don't, any money. Yeah, don't really know anything about this world, right? I didn't, I didn't know about venture, really. Mm. And so you're kind of learning about it. It's also, Again, today, I feel like there's much more of a conversation around it. You're talking about term sheets. You're talking about valuations. This was a time when, you know, a lot of this was under the radar. People weren't right. talking about yeah. it. So um, I was speaking to Venture Capital. Whitney had made the introduction to NEA, which is a fund in the US. I, I spoke to this guy. I told him what I was planning to build. He introduced me to one of his partners. I spoke to her. And the next day, I had a term sheet. It was wild mm -hmm. and not really how this stuff goes by the way yeah. as you know mm -hmm. we know it doesn't really happen like that i came back to the uk and i was like wow <laughs> oh, that was easy super easy <laughs> let Last me check here i let, come <laughs> let me check who else is in my email because that's all i need to do just mm. tell them and actually obviously it's not that easy so then it did take me um another couple of months to close the round because the u.s market in particular then was very different to the European market. I really felt I needed someone from Europe because I was here and I was building here. Um, and I didn't really feel like I needed two US funds at that point. Mm -hmm. um, the problem was our valuation was higher than the like European funds were used to seeing for a pre-seed, what was a pre-seed round. So I had to learn all of that on the bounce and kind of go with it. But then we closed around with amazing investors, uh, Partek and Felix, and it, it was, Phenomenal. But then I had a lot of venture money and a lot of funds on my cap table. And I was like, I don't really know what this means. I think that was one of the most terrifying things as well. I also, I don't know whether it's a, a women's thing or I don't know, but I, I kind of feel like I was at least very programmed, like not to take people's money, if that makes right. sense. And you suddenly are in a situation where you have millions that you're essentially being given to make something happen and to make this money into more money. That's right. And you're like, okay, <laughs> it's like, be right back, <laughs> one second. How do I make this five times what it is, 10 times what it is, 100 times what it With is? With a formula that I haven't yet worked out. Right, because now I need to go and build something, get product market fit, and then work out how to grow it. I mean, those are things that take time. And honestly, and I would say this to anyone, honestly, um, I took venture money too early. And I wish I'd have taken venture money a stage later. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd have built something and then done it. Um, I wish I'd have done these like friends and family round, which I had no idea about. And I had no which friends. Which also just not a thing. Yeah. I, I, my friends wouldn't even let me a fiver for, for a beer. I, literally, I was like, who, who has friends who write 50 grand checks? And mm. can I get those friends? <laughs> I don't have those friends. So, but I wish I'd have done more of that kind of angel round. But again... Who knew what an angel was back then? Like the, the world was different mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say. And uh, I like that you're, you were schooled in don't take 
other people's money because the sooner you take it the quicker you're on that mm -hmm. you know cycle to return and so at that point when you've got the money and you're kind of as you say you would have you would probably go back and raise later if you did it again how did you t then turn that into an idea and what was that timeline or, or you already had an idea how did you turn that into a business build a team all of those different things that you would need to actually make that into something you know the other thing that's important to note is I had been one of, I had 300 in London, I had 300 people in Moscow, I had a very big business. All of a sudden, I had me, and it was very humbling to go from having teams who did this mm. stuff and hiring teams to being like, can I afford to hire someone to do this? Yeah. Um, I brought one person over for, who I worked with um, called Hannah, and she's still with me today and VP of brand now, but she... And I kind of worked a lot of this out together and effectively kind of worked out what startup life was like together. We hired an iOS end, a designer, pushed the boat out and got an Android end like a, a, a few months later. <laughs> Treat yourself. You know, it was really that kind of thing. Can we afford to do it? I was going to the baby raves with foam peanut fingers to raise brand awareness. And I was standing handing those out. I was going and doing like badges and flyers. Hannah was like, we, everything came from us. There were no people. Mm -hmm. We were the people. Um, and it's only by getting the people in that you can work out whether the product even works, you know? And so in terms of going from you and Hannah to being, when was your next round after that? We did it uh, actually in the September, so pretty quick after launch. And what? Do, what? How different did the business look from that time to when you were raising again? I mean, we had a product, yeah. So that was good. Really exciting. We had Always helpful. Yeah, we had a product. We had a little team or a team of four. Um, we had um, uh, traction. We had users. We had women who were making friends on our platform, and more than that, they were coming back. And more than that, we had a presence in the US. We had. Um, been the first app of the day on the new app store for um on ios when apple launched the new app store so we were at wwd so the big worldwide developer conference and tim cook was on stage and there was little peanut and we were literally a little peanut we were four months old um so we'd had that kind of what we were saying about motherhood what we were saying about the brand we wanted to be and the product was resonating we had the seeds of reson like something resonating. Which is the most exciting thing, because I think also, you know, I was um, lucky enough to be in a position where we raised post revenue. So we, that formula we talked about in terms of how do I turn this into this, we had that formula, we knew what it was, we just need to build on that formula yeah. and make that formula bigger and better. Um, and I guess one of the most terrifying things is when you're raising and you kind of have this, you have this, either this MVP or proof that people want the concept, but actually people say they want a lot of things. And actually when it comes to it, it might not translate into, or they might spend Absolutely. the first week swiping on the app and then be like, oh yeah. I could say so much on those things. What people say they want and what users ask for and what they actually do are very different. Trying to work out what they mean. Sometimes they're doing things that you're not even mm. trying to push them in and there's a different behavior. Data is so important. You have to obsess over it. Did we move that metric? Why did we move it? What did we change? So definitely that has transformed our business, really, being obsessed by data. And were there any times that you kind of had to change a concept that you thought was going to be inherent and, you know, a big part of the idea? Oh, I mean, we've done so, we've done so many things that we've changed along the way. During COVID, for example, uh, women couldn't meet in real life, of right? So all of a sudden, the friendship finding part of Peanut was like, well, I don't want to make new friends because I can't leave the house or I don't want to make new friends because I haven't got time because everyone in my family is now in my home all day. And I'm like, I, I've, our demographic, we're the most time poor demographic of anyone um, globally. So at that point, we were like, we need to build some kind of synchronicity to mm -hmm. the product. So everything that you do on social networks currently is async, right? You post something, someone comments at whatever time they see it. Uh, and we need some kind of synchronous connection. So we spoke around audio and video. Which way do we go? Do we do live audio? Do we do live video? It's before Clubhouse was the thing. And we, we, we went live video, actually. And the answer was, 
women asked for that. They wanted to have video chat, but they didn't really mean that because mm -hmm. of course, no one wanted to look at themselves. We've been looking at ourselves all day on Zoom or we've been like absolutely flat out all day trying to get homeschooling done, try and do a bit of work, make sure everyone's fed, you're going out of your mind, has your uncle got his medication because he can't leave the house? And all of a sudden you want to do a video chat. No, of course not. So we listened, but we didn't do the full kind of user like behavioral psychology on it. Um, and then Clubhouse came out and we'd been talking about live audio. So right. of course we were like, mm. really good. Thanks guys. <sighs> um, and that was, that was a massive learning for us. We went actually, as it goes, turned out great. We could learn what they were doing, what worked, what didn't work. We could build our version of live audio and it's my favorite part of the app. So, um, Loads of stuff like that, all the time. So I hate asking women who come on here about their personal lives because yeah. I think that that's a very classic of a business thing than talking to women about their personal life. But considering you were building an app for mums, right. I can imagine that those early startup days when you, you have a young child, you're trying to make it all work. I can yeah. imagine that was really, really tough. Can you talk to that a bit in terms yeah. of the experience? It was so hot, honestly, it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. Starting a business is all consuming. Mm -hmm. It's the first thing you think about if you're lucky enough to get to sleep when you wake up, right? And if you are really at a point where it's hard or whatever, you rarely sleep. To throw into the mix a like two and a half year old who also wasn't brilliant sleeping or mm -hmm. whatever it is and has his own little life and development whilst you're flying to the US once a month, I was spending a week a month in the States. It was really, really hard. Plus you're trying to hire the best people, get everyone energized about the vision, look at trends, is the product doing okay? Are we like supporting everyone on the, on the platform well enough? You're making massive sacrifice all the time. Can I get back for his first school play? Well, I'm gonna have to, that means that I, will fly overnight, go straight from the airport to school, sit there and then go back and go into my normal working day. Like you're, you're just making sacrifice all the time. Um, it's hard on your friendships. It's hard on your relationship. It's hard on your relationship with your family. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really challenging. And then I, a couple of years in, three years in, fell pregnant well actually in the middle I had a miscarriage but that's fine but I, I fell pregnant again with Nula um it's a big age gap between my children so Finn is eight and Nula's now two but whilst I was pregnant with Nula I was in this place it was 2019 I didn't want anyone to know I was pregnant mm -hmm. I didn't want investors to know I was pregnant because I wanted to close around I'd been talking to an investor that I really loved I still love them happy to report, um, but I really loved and we'd been talking for ages and things felt like they were getting close. It would have been like a year of getting to know each yeah. other. And I went to their office and always was in the baggies and one of my girlfriends who has her own business got out of the lift and she was like, what are you doing here? I was like, oh, well, hi. And she said, you don't even look pregnant in that outfit. And I looked at her and she was like, which is the point? Investor standing here and I was like, it's fine. It's fine. And she was I'm like, not. <laughs> yeah. We were all a funny joke. We, we were all like. <laughs> funny girl you are. And as it goes, they wrote the check, right? But that meant that I was fundraising whilst pregnant. Literally, I think we closed the round and I had Nula three days later. And that, again, was really difficult. And then there's no such thing as maternity leave. So no. the whole thing is, um, it's a lot and you have to love it. That's the most important thing. And how, when you'd had, you know, an, I, a night of no sleep is obviously very normal for someone with a, a baby. Mm. It's also very normal for someone who's trying to grow a business yeah. and having an absolute nightmare of it. How did you get up and keep going on those mornings where you hadn't slept all night? Nightmares with the the kids or, or yeah. the kid and, and nightmares with the business. How did, you, how did you keep going? I just believe in what we're doing and mm -hmm. I love it. Like, I believe that women deserve a platform to have conversations that mm -hmm. they can't have anywhere else. I believe that we deserve something that, a, a platform and a product that has an opinion. We have stuff to say, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna say it. And it, honestly, without sounding like completely cheesy, it is the greatest honor of my entire life to build Peanut, because there are conversations that happen on that platform that where but for our platform do they have it? 
If you're in a domestic violence relationship and you need someone to tell you how to get out of it, but you haven't got any friends because you're in that relationship because they've made sure you've got no friends. Mm -hmm. How do you get out? But for being able to join a live audio of women who are like, it happened to me, do this, try. Th so it's that kind of thing. And, and that's a very like sad example right through to, you know, women laughing about whatever. I love it and I believe in it. And so it keeps me going. And also I want my kids to see that, you know, if they see a problem and they want to fix it, they can do it. So all of that. It makes, I mean, it makes a huge amount of sense. And also believing so much in your idea, being so much bigger than you and being about kind of creating something that's different. And, you know, we've talked about how little tech there is specifically for women, but specific, also specifically built by women. Yeah. Um, I can imagine that being a huge kind of spur in deciding to do things. And your, part of your journey as well, I know, has in kind of informed what you've decided to do with Peanut. So I know that you, obviously, at one point, it was, it was just mums, and then yeah. you kind of took it beyond mums. Um, and I, I, I read that that was because you noticed these conversations happening that... I can imagine if you're trying to conceive, for example, or you're having some issues with infertility or you've miscarried and you're kind of probably thinking, the last place I want to be is on an app with all these mums who have exactly what I want to have. Right. What made you decide at that point that actually this needs to be bigger than that? Because it makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. And what made you decide this needs to be bigger than that and this needs to be um, beyond a conversation just of active motherhood and being more about the Roots wider thing. yeah the, the wider kind of purpose i think that um we always look at what women are talking about on the product right generally speaking if there's a social trend we know it before it's even really like become a trend because women are talking about it more prolifically on peanut and that might be to do with um guns in the us or black lives matter we can see these these moments kind of coming up um and something that was recurring on peanut was really around secondary fertility. So women who had had a child through whatever means first time, and they were struggling to have a second. Right. Um, and we were like, well, this makes sense. We can build something for all the women who aren't there yet, are thinking about access to motherhood through whatever, IVF, surrogacy, adoption. Maybe they're just trying and they don't know what that looks like. Maybe they've suffered loss. We can build a walled garden. We can take everything we know, build it again. Um, and so, and, and kind of send you in that different path. But knowing that if you are trying, you're going to be triggered by someone sharing their baby photo. Mm. Similarly, if you've been trying for five years and you finally get the positive pee stick, you want to share it. But that's very triggering for other people. So mm -hmm. it's about balancing some of those things and using, um, basically building around it. So how can we signal and signpost to make sure that we have sensitive content filters and um, the community at large are enabled to, to do that. So that was that part. And then more recently, actually, as the distance between uh, motherhood and menopause starts to reduce because women are having babies later, mm, because we're starting to understand more about what menopause is, because it isn't something that happens in your like, late 50s and 60s. It's something that can start age 35 freak out so it's one of those things that i right so it's one of those things that if we don't know we don't know how to address it and it it's really um suppressive to women to not share and let women have those conversations so we started to see women who were saying i'm going to my physician i think i've got early onset dementia i think i've got alzheimer's and other women being like girl get your hormones checked you're in perimenopause there's nothing wrong with you um, and so we were like, well, hang on, there's something else we can do here so we can replicate the walled garden and build this for women who are going through menopause as well. Because the biggest kind of wider vision for Peanut is that all women should have a safe space to find community and ask questions around life stages. And that might be adolescence and that might be, you know, later years, my kids have gone, I've got an empty nest and I want to like mm. work out what's next for me and everything in between, chronic illness, whatever it is. Peanut should be that safe space. Um, I want it to be cross-generational. Three women, all in the same family, each using Peanut to, for their own purpose. And so that's what we're building for now. But it's really led by, by the women and what they talk about. So I'd say two things about what you've just said. I'd say number one, it, I think it is a really amazing case study for products that are built on not just community but truly and we hear this kind of buzzword of like we're community led yeah. we do all of this yeah. and it's like okay a lot of the time products are but a lot of the time 
they're community led in that they tell their community what to want and then and then they kind of want it. What it sounds like with Peanut is that it is so the basis of it all is about that community and about the community telling you, not even just through surveys and reviews and all of this, but actually through your actual listening to every customer on the app, you're able to create a, an even better product at every stage of the journey. Um, and I think I just wanted to say that I think that that is a fantastic case study for truly customer first business um, that listens to, and, and I'm sure at times you would have had kind of oh, we'll go in this direction. And actually all the data then from the people on the app is saying, well, because trend data might be telling you to go in one direction. Right. And actually everything on the app is telling you to go in another direction. And that truly customer first ethos, I can imagine, gets you a huge amount of retention um, and, and love from your customers who are actually being served exactly what they want to be served. And then secondly, what I wanted to say is that I think... This is also an incredible case study for women making products for women. And, um, you know, on, on in my case, I'd say probably slightly less noble. We make products for women in that we make activewear for women. And we're able to sit in a room and be like, move the fucking crotch seam. Like no one wants it here. And it yeah. will be the finance person and the customer service person and all of this. And it makes so much sense for women to be making products for women. However, in a landscape where women in the top year ever, like biggest high so far, got 2.8% of Woo. venture capital funding. Oh my God, it's Woo. so big, it's so exciting. I can't believe we did this. <sighs> um, how do we create a world where women make products for women or women are part of tech being built for women or all of these different things when women cannot secure the funding to build the businesses to then show success cases to then have money put back into women's businesses. It's the biggest frustration I think that I can ever, ever share or display. You know, the biggest period app, or one of the biggest in, in the world is built by guys, two guys. They own all that data. They were actually done recently by the FTC for selling that data, right? This is, this is the consequence of what we're doing because if you don't understand, even decisions like Roe and Wade, right? The consequence then of having a period tracking app and what that might mean then, if you do need to seek an abortion and you live in the US, there's so much consequence to women not under, like being in the control and the driving seat and, and men not understanding why that's significant. So that's its own like kind of social issue. From an investment perspective, it is not enough just to have women who are um, at associate or principal level looking at the deals or even at the partner level. Unless women are on the IC, making investment decisions, we cannot correct the cycle because women can only push it so far. There is unconscious bias, even at that IC level. We have to have a seat there. What then has to happen is we have to invest in more women so that women have more exits, so that women can invest as LPs in funds or as angels in, in other um, investments so that we can keep filling the cycle because the more women who have successful exits the more women flood the system, the more we can start to put pressure on funds to say, I want you to have a minimum of X number of um, investments in women or minority um, founders. I want you to have a representation of women on your IC and I want to see it. We don't hold the money to push to make those changes happen. And that's the only way we can do it. And it's, it's so frustrating, 2.8%. Mm, it's so good. It's what a win. What a win for what a win. Guys. You know, in if we think about where the market is now and the market is it's the worst market really ever um versus where we were particularly across covid and in that those two years of being the best years for venture it was the lowest for women raising finance. Well exactly and I think that one of the so I spend my time for fun getting angry about this. And I feel like, you know, one of the one of the things that made most sense to me, there's a few different like cycles that per perpetuate based on women not getting money. One of the big ones is obviously there are fewer women exits, so fewer success cases of women founders. So people don't say, okay, great, we know that works. They're kind of still thinking like, oh, but these aliens, like we don't know what to do with them. How can they build right. a business? But one of the big ones as well is that in 
we'll always go into kind of like cyclical recessions and there'll be pandemics and there'll be wars and there'll be a lot of things that kind of throw off the the economy um, that make people, um, that, that make financial decisions different. And what happens in those times is that people essentially decide, okay, well, everything's too much of a risk at the moment, so we'll invest in what we know. And the investment kind of world has been like this old boys club for a very long time, mm. but it perpetuates even more when every time there is a blip, which will be every year. Think of the past few years, we've had a blip in something. Like there's always been something where mm -hmm. it's like, this has made us a bit more cautious. And every time they'll go, well, what do we know? We know men in tech. We know men essentially coming in as co-founder roles or CEO roles in whatever it might be. And we'll invest in that over and over again. And then how that perpetuates is that women founded businesses hire so many more women into leadership positions because they're not, I mean, huge generalization, yeah. but in general won't be as terrified of like, oh my God, but what if they have a child? Or, you know, what if they fall pregnant? Or what if they have children now and want to go and do the school run and all of these different things, which then perpetuates every single other area of gender inequality in the workplace. And I think that actually because VC funding and funding in general isn't as much of a mainstream conversation, mm. it's not seen as such a big problem. Whereas if the only stories we're seeing about women in business are either, you know, like small, you know, Cottage. family businesses yeah. or they're Theranos scandal, yeah. or they are this kind of girl boss rhetoric where we build up these women founders and then like rip them down yep. and rip them down rather than the company yep. itself for every single thing yep. that go wrong. How can we ever get out of this cycle of lack of investment in women? The problem is we iconize women founders. So we put them on the front of the magazine and we make them these goddesses who we all must kind of try to emulate or become. And we don't show enough kind of different stories and enough women so that we think that there really is only this one kind of type of founder as a woman. And then we make mistakes because we're human or we don't make mistakes. Or because business or, is about making mistakes right. and you can't grow if you don't make mistakes. Abs absolutely. And then as you say, and then we tear them down and we love it and we like to watch everyone tearing it down. And it's women journalists who are writing the, the articles in the first place. That, that There is so much challenge there. And while we're busy doing that, men are busy quietly building their business, right? And that's the other challenge because while we're distracted by the goddess complex, that these guys are quietly... I bet you don't know what the founder of Spotify looks like. I couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. But we know exactly what Whitney looks like. We know what Audrey Gelman looks like. We know what all of these women Emily look like. Emily Vi, Sophia Amaru. Right. This is the whole story. It's, I think that as soon as I started reading articles about this as well, because I, I constantly think, like, I know my day's going to come. I know there will be one point where I'm, you know, I, I currently will experience huge amounts of privilege in the fact that I'm a young white woman mm -hmm. who can, conforms to a lot of kind of, like, like society will see me in a certain way and then be like, oh my God, girl boss. <laughs> like she's, she's got the money, she's got the business. Yeah. Like look at her nails and all of this and they build you up. And there'll be one point where I'm sure I'll do something wrong within the business. It was a bad decision, which is part of building a business. And I'm sure I will tear myself to shreds for it more than anyone else can. But I also know, and I'm sure you'll have the exact same, that at this point, rather than the business rhetoric that, you know, when a Peloton goes a bit, awry or a WeWork or any of this. And it's like the crash and this is what happened. WeWork's slightly different because it was a bit of a scandal, but it's kind of taken down and like, they spent too much on this. They did too much on this. It's like, it, as soon as you start noticing it, they go to the women founders themselves and they say, this person did this, this and this, and they spent this on shoes, <laughs> like all of this stuff. And it's like, I didn't realize for how, how long I kind of, fell for these almost like gossipy stories of That's these women right. who have raised hundreds of millions and actually built fucking phenomenal things. And yeah, of course they made mistakes. We all make mistakes on the everyday, especially in business. It's literally what you're encouraged to do to be able to find out what works. It's and the engineering mindset. If I make a mistake and I beat myself up, my, all of my engineers will be like, but that's how you write the correct piece of code because you work out which one is the right piece that makes it work. You know, that's how you yeah. get to the correct answer. It is a distraction, I promise, for anyone who's doing this. Don't get drawn into that. 
You don't have to be like anyone else as a founder. You make your own rules. You write your own way of doing it. You might be inspired by other people. And by the way, those other people can also be guys. It doesn't have to be all in the same kind of format. But I promise that while we're being distracted by that noise, other people aren't in the limelight and they're building and they're getting away with it. Now, the other side to that is when you are building businesses for women and consumer products for women, of course, there is an affinity with your user base and Absolutely. you. And so you do want to speak to your users and you do want to be um, seen to grow and build and share stories and normalize conversations because no one else is doing it if we don't talk about it. So there is a real kind of conflict often. But um, I think honestly, it has to be about making sure that we all openly say, yeah, you know, I might get it wrong. Yeah. If I get it wrong, know that it was only because I was trying. I always thought that the, the more successful Tala got or my, kind of business as a whole or investments or whatever it might be, the more I would step away from sharing things online. And I actually think that in since the investment, I've tried to show as much as possible things that go right and things that go wrong. I'll share more because I'd like to protect myself from the fact that I, I'm sure we'll make a mistake one day yeah. and I will, rather than being, having all of the things that make us like glorify and iconize and put on a pedestal these women founders, will be ripped down. It's kind of like, oh yeah, and here are all the 23 mistakes I made before then. And also I'd like to encourage that as being like, part of the normal conversation of a business because otherwise it's only the good things and then when the bad things happen it's so much more of a thing whereas I'd we have to see mistakes that women founders make particularly as a normal part of the journey otherwise we're not protected against this kind of inevitable downfall but I also think the one thing I wanted to say was that We've both, I know because because we've had conversations before, the first conversation I had with you, I was introduced to you, was it by another female founder? No, it was by JC. Oh, of course it was, yes. And, um, but I would say also like the large majority of introductions I've had to women founders are by another woman founder. Yeah. And I will say from the being VC backed in the UK, I'd say there's about 20 people that literally it goes round and round in circles yeah. and we all have invested in as many women owned businesses yeah. as possible um, that we can actually yeah. do. Obviously there'll be kind of limited funds um, in order to help turn this around. And I know you find this really important and I know you invest in a lot of female founders. I know we had one conversation and you were like, here's this person, here's this person and here's some money. And yeah. that's exactly what we need to do. But it's also, it has to be more than that. And I yeah. think that also people love to say, oh, well, this woman's back, this woman, how generous. And it's like, this is fantastic. And we need to keep doing this because we need to keep being generous with our contacts and keep being generous yeah. with our finance yeah. and all of these things. But also how do we turn that from something into something where it's like, okay, well, it can't just be on women to rectify the women's funding situations. Because at the end of the day, we're not the VCs sitting there with billions to, that they have to deploy every year. It's the most frustrating thing ever for anyone to ever say that there isn't deal flow and there isn't deal flow insofar as it relates to women founders. I think I did 18 deals last year. Right. And of that 18, 16 were women um, or funds with the aim of funds investing in women. Mm -hmm. Or it was the partner at the fund who was a woman who approached me. That That's how it's been. Um, and if I can get the deal flow, I think the funds with the resources that they have can get the deal flow, right? The deals are out there to be done. Um, there's like a cabal sometimes, right? Where people are like, ooh, um, I'm going to do a secondary. Do you want to do a secondary on this deal? Secondary means when you're selling some of your shares that you own in something. So you're going to um, do the secondary. And it's like guys who are doing it. So again, it self-perpetuates. They do the secondary amongst themselves. They get richer at exit. Exit, more money back into funds, male money. That's, that's where it starts and that's where it ends. Them getting richer and we're not part of it. And unless we increase women's wealth, we can't increase the kind of the, the land share of anything. But you're right, we do need to bring men along on the journey too. There are brilliant um, angel investors in particular and, and, and VCs who are um, guys who are looking at the space and they want to. Um, one of my investors tells me this story once about, because I had said like, I don't see any women-led business in your portfolio at all. 
And he said, I know. And so I've scrapped the pipeline. I've scrapped it and I started again because I looked at my pipeline and everyone looked the same and they all had the same background. I've started again. That's why I'm talking to you. There are people who are willing to do the work. And if you find them, they're like gold dust. And the most important thing is if you find them, introduce them to all of your friends who are uh, founding businesses, starting businesses, get them on their radar. And so what would your recommendation be to women who are trying to start a business now who kind of want to go for funding but aren't really sure where to start and obviously know about the big old gap? Start, <laughs> start with asking yourself whether you need venture funding. Mm -hmm. I spoke to someone a couple of weeks ago. Her business is brilliant and it's profitable and she's not right for venture, in my opinion. There are other ways that she can do what she needs to do. She can take uh, venture debt, for example. You can finance in other ways. Do you really need to take venture? If you do and you've done that work and you've done that research and now you're ready to say, yes, this is a business that will benefit from being venture backed, then you need to start thinking about how do you build your network? It's all about networks. That person that you spoke to one time, you know, 10 years ago, look them up. The amount of people I emailed at the beginning of our round Absolutely. being like, hello, it's Hi. been a nice five years. Um, uh, how are you? Remember me? Life's changed. So yeah, <laughs> but you do. You go back and you start building that network and you do a little bit like when I was building Peanut. You ask that woman or that guy, who should I speak to? Who do you think could be interested in this? Who are there, is there anyone else? And by the way, it shouldn't always be about the money. Some of those people you meet won't be mm -hmm. able to invest but they'll have the best network ever. So it's always about finding and expanding. And it really is that kind of speak to one, intro to one, speak to one, intro to one. And as soon as you start to work out your network, it will happen. Give yourself way more time than you think you need, especially in this market. Um, but you know, women back led businesses are the great businesses to back in a recession, by mm -hmm. the way. We always perform better. And also that's the that's the funny thing. There are so many statistics. It's not just us being like, oh, look at that money. It's like there is so many statistics to say the outperformance of um of kind of women-led businesses. Absolutely. And of course, that's going to be as before someone says, of course, that's gonna be a smaller sample size because you haven't fucking given us money, so we can't prove you wrong. But like the actual performance wise, and I do think as much as it can't just be down to women, I also do think it is hugely important, and I know we both find it hugely important, to back women-owned businesses, to be as generous as possible with our contacts. Anyone who kind of DMs me and says, this is the business I'm having, I'm trying to raise through VC, this is the proof, you know, like this is, yeah. you know, this is what we're doing and this is what's great. I like genuinely, if I see it, I will kind of help as much as I physically can. And it's, it's, it's tough that it comes down to that, but it's also, that's absolutely what we have to do. And especially because it's difficult when we're saying, well, women need to have more of the wealth and it's all about network when actually then imagining how bad it is for women in terms of the statistics for raising venture funding, imagining how bad it is for black women, for um, people from underprivileged backgrounds, for people who, I mean, you know, I know that I will, even though I'm not a kind of quote unquote safe bet in terms of being like part of the old boys club, there's part of that as well. There are statistics on how much, how many more businesses are backed from, you know, people who went to Oxbridge or all of these things that of course it will make it like a, a yep. safer bet, even yep. if it's not a kind of blanket yep. safe bet. Yeah, it is a problem. It, it, it isn't just women. It's all underrepresented founders, right, across the board. And you're absolutely right. We are not taught how to network in a way that men from a certain background have always been taught how to network. It's, it's ingrained in what they do and how they do things. It's how business used to be done. But if you take it right back to basics, it was mums who could make or break a business. They would introduce people for relationships, for marriage. These were the original kind of deal makers. The husbands came together for dinner because the wives introduced it. That was the old school. And so it's really about kind of reimagining that in, in the life that we lead today. Women are being counted in terms of our contribution to the economy in a way that we never have been before. So. There is so much of an expectation gap. If we have to contribute to the economy, what are you doing for us to help us get there? And, and that in itself is also a challenge. And, and that applies to anyone who's an underrepresented founder because you're LGBTQ, because you're black or from another minority background. It's across the board. There is a reason why all the founders look pretty much 
similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. It's a, I think it's a conversation we could talk about <laughs> for a really long time. Always. Um, but before we wrap up, I'd love to know what you would say to the the you who is who's just left your job, yeah. who's starting out Peanut, who's going to get funding and who's embarking on this long idea that kind of takes you to where you are now. What would be your piece of advice? Take a holiday <laughs> before you start. Um, no, actually hire more, hire more. I, I, I didn't hire enough people and I relied on four people doing 10 people's work. And um, that made it harder in so many ways. I would hire more quickly in order to become more efficient at what we were doing because it's that weird thing of you're saving money but actually it's more expensive because it's taking you longer mm -hmm. um my husband likes to say cheap becomes expensive but that is what it is it you're, you're not thinking about how to um invest your time well so I wish I'd have done that yeah I think that's so true and I think it's it's again part of the same thing of the risk aversion when you've just taken someone's money and you're kind of thinking, how do I turn this into as much as possible, but also not burn it. Don't spend so it, don't like, spend oh, it. just keep it here. That's and actually, it. you know, this is what we're getting used to now as well of being like, this budget isn't, we don't want to be under budget in this area. Like we, we want to be spending all that money and actually changing from last year when we weren't venture backed to this year and right. essentially being like, no, no, no. A step change. I, I know that you're saying, oh, we've saved five grand in this. I don't want to hit, go and spend that yeah. and spend it on something that's going to turn it into 10 grand. And that is such a switch in Great. mindset and also something that we haven't necessarily been programmed in our home lives to do because when are you going around and being like, well, I'm going to spend a hundred pounds more at the corner shops. So that that's I can right. Make myself more. It's, it's about being greedy, right? We have to be more greedy for um, what we deserve. And Sometimes that that's an odd expression. It's an mm. odd feeling. But it's uncomfortable. It is. But as soon as you get greedy, I you know, I want us to own the entire market in what we're building. Because I think we should, because no one else has come close. So I want all of it. As soon as you get that mindset of greediness, you start to think about, okay, so what's the quickest way to do that? Well, the quickest way wasn't with four people, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming on An today. Honor. Thank you for having me. You've been so fantastic. Thank and I you. I hope the rest of your day is good. Thank you.